You've been looking at this picture on the screen for a little while. It says accessibility is about people. And there's a picture of a tandem bicycle with L Waters on the front of the bike, Steve Sawson on the back of the bike, and Laura Legendary standing off to the side. Steve and Laura are both blind. And at CSUN this year, which is an accessibility conference, we did a tandem bike event where some of us who were sighted, some who were visually impaired, we all paired up on tandem bikes and rode around San Diego. It was amazing. Um, and the more time I spend with people with disabilities, the more I, I just I care so much about accessibility because it means I can make things that work for my friends. So to me, accessibility is 100% about people. It's really cool to be a developer and actually get to make an impact. Today, you are here to learn about accessibility in Angular and in other JavaScript MVC frameworks because what I'm gonna to talk to you about today it's pretty common in frameworks like React and Ember and Angular, Backbone, Spine. The challenges that we find with accessibility exist in anything that is rendered on the client. So I'm gonna try and point out what's common in accessibility of single page apps or MV star apps or however you wanna to refer to those. I actually work on the Angular team. I work at a company called Substantial uh, working full time on material design for Angular, which is an implementation I'll tell you a little bit more about later. But I also contribute to the Angular core framework. My slides are online at marcysutton.com slash fluent2015 if you want to go check those out. Angular accessibility doesn't have the best backstory or the best reputation. And part of the issue was that um, the Angular 1 documentation site promoted not best practices for accessibility. They would have forms without labels. Some of this has since been fixed, but it promoted poor accessibility. So my challenge was to try and make accessibility better. And so far that's going pretty well. Um, but there's tweets from people in the accessibility community like Paul Adam saying AngularJS web apps are never accessible because even the books on it start with inaccessible examples. So this is what we're overcoming but I have a lot of energy and excitement to try and make it better. So that's been going pretty well so far. Angular and me. I became involved with Angular by being loud, <laughs> by having a Twitter account and saying, hey, this could be more accessible. Things like uh, airline websites and things that a lot of people use, but they just weren't built with accessibility in mind. And that drove me crazy. And somehow I <laughs> maneuvered my way onto the Angular team and I've been able to actually contribute accessibility to a framework. Um, and so that's basically how I came to work on Angular. Today I'm gonna to tell you about material design and the project I work on, material design for Angular. And I'm going to frame that with an accessibility lens. And so I'm gonna be talking about material design in Angular, but I'm gonna signpost major accessibility topics in single page apps. You will see them noted with a taco. The little taco going woohoo. And if you want a taco button, I actually have a few and you can come and grab one from me later. I'm also gonna tell you about NG Aria, which is the accessibility module in Angular, which I'm a core contributor to. I'll tell you what that does for you and what it doesn't do for you. We'll talk about Protractor, which is the end-to-end -end testing framework for Angular that I wrote a plugin for that'll help you audit for accessibility. And then I'll touch a little bit on Angular 2 at the end. This is primarily focused on Angular 1, but given that Angular 2 is on the horizon, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Material design for Angular. Material design, if you haven't heard of it, you probably have, but it's a design language that Google created to create a cohesive design language across all of their platforms. So Android, there's a Polymer implementation of material design. Um, I work on the Angular implementation. And so the idea is that there's a common set of components and typography guidelines and styles that get a, a certain look across all of these platforms. And there's actually a really cool design specification I've linked in my slides. This big graphic is actually a link and it, you can go look through ma the material design guidelines. So I was pulled on to material design for Angular 1. Being an accessibility person with a design background and being a developer, this is pretty much my dream project and I love working on this project. I get to make components like checkboxes and dialogues and typography guidelines and all these things more accessible using Angular. And so through that I get to 
dog food things like NG Aria, and we haven't used the Protractor plugin I'm gonna tell you about yet, but um, this project has been an opportunity to show what's possible in accessibility of a UI framework. And you can actually visit that website at material.angularjs.org. Some of the things that I've gotten to really make better in Angular Material are common concepts in accessibility for single page apps. We've got a taco on the screen, so that means that this is a major issue in single page apps or client rendered apps for accessibility, and that's interactivity. That means that if you're using a keyboard or a screen reader, uh, or maybe you're navigating by voice, that's um, something to consider as well, not just using your mouse or a trackpad. There's people who can't use a mouse or a trackpad and they need visual feedback so that when they're tabbing through a web page, they know where they are, they know the state of things. So interactivity is a major concept in this. And some of the, the components in Angular Material, like the checkbox, I'm actually focused on a checkbox right now and it's, it's a little hard to see on the monitor, but there's actually a gray focus ring that's a custom material design style. And it tells me that I'm focused on the checkbox. If I hit the space bar, I get feedback that it, it is now checked. And I can go to the next one, which is a switch that's a, similar to a checkbox. It's basically the same component under the covers, but it has a different style. If I hit the space bar, I can enable the switch. I can go through the buttons and get some visual feedback. I can use the, the radio buttons. Let's see, where am I right now? Okay, so I can use the arrow keys to go through radio buttons because they're a group, so you should only be able to be to only be able to select one at a time. So these are things that we have to think about with accessibility. Can I make it interactive from the keyboard? Can I interact with it from a screen reader? So this is something that we have to consider. Semantics is another big topic in accessibility, and this definitely applies even if you're making a, a web application, which a lot of people will say, well, it's an application, it's not a document. But if, for the people who are consuming that application, they need to know what the structure of it is. You need to use headings. Um, in Angular Material, we have things like buttons. I have an example of the Material Design button, which the API for it, when you're writing the HTML, you would actually put in md-button as a tag name. But we use this process in Angular called transclusion, where we actually take that original tag and we spit out something else. And the, uh, the something else that we spit out with MD button is a button. Because the button tag gives you so much for free that you would otherwise have to recreate with JavaScript that it just becomes not really worth it after a while. So we make these decisions on Angular Material about when we should spit out a native element, when we should add ARIA. Um, and so the MD button is one example where we definitely use the button. Or if you put an href on MD-button, it will spit out an anchor because that's a link. Another example is the checkbox. This one, we actually don't use the native input. We use ARIA, which if you aren't familiar, it stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And ARIA is a specification of attributes that you can add to your HTML to add semantics, to add state and properties. So to make something really a checkbox in a screen reader, it needs a few things. Because it says md-checkbox, that's essentially a fancy div with a custom name. So to make it really a checkbox, it needs a role of checkbox that says that's what this thing is. It's an instance of a checkbox. To be able to tab onto it with the keyboard, the interactive piece I mentioned earlier, we need tab index. Tab index is awesome. Uh, I highly recommend sticking with values of zero and not going to the positive numbers because the positive numbers, you then have to manage everything in the document and that can be hard to manage. You can also use a tab index of negative one to pull something out of the tab order, and we use that a lot. It's, it makes it, um, it's a tool that you can use to manage the tab order of your document. And then lastly, for the material design checkbox, we need to add aria-checked of true. And that's because this isn't a custom, or this isn't a native input tag. So the checked attribute doesn't actually map to a screen reader, to what's called an accessibility API. To communicate that this custom checkbox is checked or not, we have to use aria-checked. Um, and so I encourage you, if you're writing custom components, to really get familiar with aria, because we have to make sure that these components 
if we're going to you know, use this power to create custom tags, and this applies to web components as well, we have to make sure that they're usable from the keyboard and a screen reader um, or any other kind of assistive technology. Part of this that I've dealt with, with um, you know, making really specific styles, making it uh, fit with the material design guidelines, for the buttons in particular, uh, on GitHub we'll often have issues where the focus style is persisting and I used my mouse so I don't want the focus style to show. And this is actually us up against what the browser does natively. When you click on something in the browser, you're focusing on it. So if you hit tab, it goes to the next thing. If you use a custom focus style, because we, many people hate that blue focus ring in Chrome, for example, if you add a custom focus style and you click on something in the browser, it will show that focus style. And psych psychologically, that's not really what we expect, and so it gets flagged as a bug. And I've come up with this again and again and again on Angular Material, so I thought I would tell you about it. I sort of had to hack the browser focus to get around this. So on the buttons, I have some JavaScript where I actually check if you are clicking with the mouse. And if you are, then I set a really short timeout just so that it won't show you the focus style. I really would love to ditch this. I would love to work with Chrome or work with the browser vendors to try and fix this solution uh, because we're relying on JavaScript. And this, from accessibility perspective, is not my favorite thing. But you might come up against this, and so this is how I solve it. Uh, was using JavaScript, um, a mouse down event, uh, checking if you're actually using the mouse. If you aren't, then it will just show you the keyboard focus when you tab. And so it makes it so that you can have a rich experience for a keyboard user and for a mouse user. Everybody's happy, except for me, because I had to hack at it. Our next signpost with the taco, a major issue in single page apps for accessibility, are text alternatives. We often want to have an icon that doesn't have any semantic meaning. Maybe it's a hamburger button, or maybe it's an X to close something or remove something. We have to actually tell people who can't see what that is, or maybe they don't know what that icon means. We need to give them some clues about what that thing does. And so text alternatives are a really important concept, not even in single page apps, in web, web development in general. Um, but there's a number of ways that you can add text alternatives to your code. And the first way is using CSS, using the visually hidden class. And this one's lifted from the HTML5 boilerplate. And it's CSS that I pretty much copy and paste between every project because it's so useful. But what it does is inside of a button, for example, if I had, say I had a span that had the icon then I can use that span to represent the actual icon glyph. And then I have another span next to it that has this visually hidden class, and it has the text in it. Then I can have both of these, they, they both render, but the visually hidden version is either way off to the left of the screen, or maybe it's clipped to be only one pix like zero pixels, or there's differing ways of using visually hidden, but the idea is that it still renders because it's not using display none, uh, so the screen reader will actually be able to read this text aloud, but we can use the icon for the visual experience. Another way of adding a text alternative to something, um, and the idea with a text alternative is that you're not relying on the visual experience to communicate what the thing does. For an input in a form, or a select, or let's see, what else? Um, like any form input that Maybe it has a placeholder or some other design thing. Maybe it's an icon. To actually communicate what the input does to a screen reader, it needs to be labeled. And an obvious way to do that is to use the label element. You need to actually pair it with the input. So the input has an ID, the label has the for attribute, you pair them together, everybody's happy. Uh, you could also use the visually hidden class along with the label and put it off screen. The idea is that then for a screen reader, when they focus on the input, it announces what it is. Say it's an email input. It would say email, you know, type, start typing. Another example is using aria-label. And there was a really great piece on this written uh, just in the last week or two on the Opera, Opera blog about aria-label. I use this a lot because it's an attribute you can add to label something. So instead of putting text as a child node, 
you could just put this attribute on a button and then maybe CSS is delivering the icon. It's just another way you can add some, add some text to something. And then the last one that's probably the most obvious is adding an alt attribute onto an image. Uh, for this, it's really important that we add an alt attribute. It's pretty basic stuff, but somehow we all forget about it. So in addition to the source, you need an alt. Um, otherwise, the file name will be read. And sometimes on sites like BuzzFeed, their uh, image source is some like bunch of characters and it just like it doesn't even have a meaningful file name. So those are troublesome. One thing to note about the alt attribute is if, you, if it's purely decorative, say the image is a bullet or something that doesn't, like it wouldn't help anybody to actually put text in there. If you leave the alt attribute there but leave it empty, then it will skip over the image because it's purely decorative. So these are tools that we can use even outside of single page apps. On Angular Material, uh, we try really hard to set you up for success. We will guess, like say you, I have an example of the radio button, and say I'm choosing between a set of icons. There's no text alternative, uh, like there's no text visible. So we have to make sure, as a responsible framework developer, I wanna make sure that you are making this as accessible as possible. So we do a few things. Uh, for the radio button or the checkbox, we look for child text. And if there is any, then we will copy it to the ARIA label. And that, in a screen reader, will properly announce what the thing is. If you absolutely, you don't follow our advice and use the ARIA label attribute, which we document in our API, the last resort is in the console. If you have absolutely forgotten to label the thing, we're kind of jerks and we will log it to the console to say, hey, you forgot a label, this is really important. Um, and we actually point you to the specific node where you forgot a label. I have gotten people asking me, how do I turn that off? And I go, you add a label, maybe. <laughs> Maybe you listen to what it's telling you, and uh, yeah, people have actually asked me how to turn that off. And you know, I would love to not have to do this, but sometimes we forget. It's okay. We like you can go and add this stuff. It's people. We just want to know that we're working on it, like trying to make it better each time. And the more that you hear from people like me about tools you can use to be more accessible, like it'll get better over time. Focus management is the next taco major signpost. I'm actually going to zoom into a video. I've screencasted uh, the Angular Material side nav is one of the components that we've created. And the idea with a side nav is that when you have a small screen and you have a hamburger button and you have this side nav slide out, or say you're on a desktop site and you have it hidden, like this is a, a multi-purpose component that you could use in all different kinds of situations, not just on mobile. So when new content appears, if you're using a screen reader or a keyboard, you might not be directed to the right place if we don't manage your focus. So a big concept in single page apps or client rendered apps is focus management. What that means is that we are actually guiding the user's keyboard focus around the screen as things are happening. And this is super important. And one example I wanna show you is the side nav in Angular Material. There's two side navs, there's one that's already visible and then, actually, there's one in the doc site on the left that you can see, but the actual component demo, there's one on the left, there's a toggle right button that I'm gonna click, and when it slides in, the focus is sent into the component as it opens. So let's take a look at what Angular Material does for focus. There's a skip to content link so you can skip by all of the navigation. So we see that side nav open. There's a button, when I click it, this is actually a custom focus where you can you can now, in Angular Material, I'll show you the code for this. The HTML to mark up a side nav, it's md-sidenav, and then you can put whatever you want in it. But by default, the side nav, when it opens, we send the focus to the wrapping element, the side nav itself. Um, that's so that when the side nav opens, a keyboard or a screen reader user is directed to the new content. So we always wanna be conscious of where is my keyboard user gonna be when this thing opens, like a dialogue, for example. If the dialogue pops up, we wanna send focus into it so that the content is read aloud and then send them back when it's done. So in the side nav example, I got some feedback that people really wanted to be able to focus on a specific element because it's a multi-purpose component. They might have a form in it, that was the example we saw. 
So we want to send focus into the input. So we added another little directive in the material design side nav, this md-sidenav-focus. That is a custom directive we made that we, it allows you to send focus to a specific element. It doesn't matter what element it is, as long as it's focusable, this makes it for people consuming the framework to be able to choose what they're focusing on. But we're making it really easy to do that. So these are the kinds of things that I think about when I'm making a framework. The next major topic is notifying the user. Uh, we have an autocomplete widget that's sort of like Twitter type ahead, where if you type a tweet and you hit the at symbol and you get a list of people. Um, in the Angular Materials side nav, uh, we want to announce states, for example, as they pop up. The code for this is a directive that's actually off screen using that visually hidden class we saw earlier because it's all for screen reader. It doesn't need to be visible. We push messages to it. And the secret to announcing stuff, this is a really useful tool for single page apps. Um, and the idea is that you're focused on one thing, something's happening somewhere else, and you want to notify a screen reader user that things are happening. You can use ARIA Live, which is a big concept in accessibility. Um, and if you add a role of status or a role of alert, and those are different uh, levels of alerts, if you push messages to this, it will announce them in a screen reader. And so this is a technique that we use in the Angular Materials um, autocomplete to notify you when changes pop up. And you can either look at the Angular Material autocomplete or the Twitter type ahead, like I mentioned. These are good examples of notifying the user of something away from their keyboard focus. So we had focus management where we're actually sending you to the thing. If you want to keep the focus on something, you can use ARIA Live to actually announce changes away from their focus. Angular loves open source. We love contributors. If you want to contribute to Angular Material, that's really helpful. Um, also, Angular, the core framework, that's really awesome. And part of that, part of what came out of their love for open source and the awesome community is ng-aria. ng -Aria is an accessibility module that came out in Angular 1.3, and we're actively developing against it. Um, you can find it on the Angular docs under the, there's an accessibility guide. To include ng-aria, you just include it as a dependency. So you inject it in, when you boot up your Angular app, you can inject ng-aria as a dependency, and then the, there's a configuration. You can turn things on and off. Um, when you include Angular in your HTML, you also need to include Angular Aria at the bottom. So what Angular Aria does is it will add accessibility support to specific directives that need it, like ng-disabled or ng-model so that you won't have to actually manage all of the ARIA attributes at the same time. Because it seemed like the framework should do a little more heavy lifting for you. So this is like a work in progress. I think it does some really cool things already. It's not perfect. Um, but I'll show you some of the things it does. ng-aria and ng-disabled is a big one, where if you use ng-disabled, it would spit out the disabled attribute when that expression is truthy. That's a funny word to say. Uh, but it didn't actually spit out aria-disabled. So unless you were using ng-disabled on a native select, for example, or a native input, to a screen reader, the disabled attribute didn't actually map to say this is disabled. So for the material design checkbox, which I said we actually use a custom element, to properly disable that in assistive technology, you need aria-disabled. So ng-aria, when you include it, will spit that out for you. ng-click, this is a widespread problem, um, and part of what Angular got a bad rap for was that they make it really easy to put a click event on anything, any kind of element. It doesn't have to be interactive. You could put it on a div, and I have an example with ng-click, and the method I'm calling is, oh no, you didn't, because I really hope you don't do that. Because this is what we have to do to clean that up. ng-aria now will try to fix all of these clicks. Uh, it will add tab index. It will bind a key press event because if it's a div and you add tab index and you hit the enter key, it won't actually fire the callback of the click event. So it binds both of those. Um, and it also now adds a role of button, which is pretty heavy handed, to be honest. But this is so much stuff that I would rather not have to do <laughs> that I'm telling you, use a button. It's just trust me, I've learned this the hard way. Protractor. I'm going to switch gears here. Um, Protractor is an end-to-end -end testing framework in Angular that allows you, 
It's like a way to, instead of manually going and tapping through all your screens and paying someone to do that, you can programmatically fire up a browser, use Selenium WebDriver, and have it execute all of these tests. It's a really great, it provides a really great value because you can programmatically test things. Um, Protractor is a Node.js command line application. Um, it's great for continuous integration because you can actually fail a build if somebody breaks something for accessibility. So I thought that would be really cool if we created a plugin for accessibility. So there is now an a accessibility plugin in Protractor on their main repo where you can actually audit your site against the Chrome accessibility developer tools and 10NIO, which is an accessibility API. So what happens is you send them your source code, um, and I'll show you a little more details in a second, but it will spit you back with a set of audits, either passing or failing that, hey, you forgot the lang, lang attribute, or hey, you forgot an alt attribute, or something. Because if you can have your tooling tell you when you miss something, it's a lot easier to fix it before it goes out the door. To set it up, when you set up your protractor configuration, there's a plugin section, you can use one or both of these integrations, either Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools and Tenon, or just the Chrome version or whatever. And part of what will help you make a decision about which one to use, uh, because not everybody can let their source code go hit a remote API. I have this graph that shows what each of them does. So Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools, which is the same audit library as the browser extension, which I highly recommend, that's free. It doesn't require an API key or registration. Uh, it doesn't make an external request, so this is really good for pretty much everybody. Um, so you might ask, well, why would I use Tenon then? Because they have paid accounts and they have to use an external request. Tenon's tests are fantastic. They have a very robust set of tests where if you're working in education or uh, you have some legal requirements, I would highly recommend having people pay for a Tenon account because it's great. Some things that you could actually test for are labels. You could validate that you have a correct ARIA attribute, including a role, like uh, the actual attribute is just role, not ARIA-role, but it, and that's an easy mistake to make. Uh, the role for an image is IMG, not IMAGE. These are really easy mistakes to make, so if you can have your tooling pointed out to that you got it wrong, it'll be awesome. Uh, watched ARIA properties, like things that need to change, like disabled. Say I fill in some form fields and then uh, this form input becomes enabled. If you need to test that, you could automate it. Um, other interactions, like making sure the focus isn't dropped for the focus management piece. And then color contrast, you can automate that. I'm going to touch on Angular 2 a little bit. Um, so Angular 1 is continuing on. They, we are actively developing against Angular 1. Angular 2 is a separate website. It's angular.io. And they are thinking about accessibility a lot more this time around, which is awesome. Some of the changes in Angular 2, uh, part of it is no more directive definition object. So the, the way that they had custom attributes that you had to do ng-whatever, those are attributes. Um, they did away a lot with a lot of that. So a lot of the create your custom directives, they're moving more to a component model, so web components. And a big part of that means that you're binding to properties and not attributes. It's a very subtle change. Um, for accessibility, this opens up all kinds of possibilities. Uh, if you've been uh, tuned into the web components conversation, there's some really cool things happening there. Um, Another big piece is that there's no more JQLite DOM wrapper. And this is because five years ago, we needed jQuery and JQLite to kind of smooth out browser differences. And now things like Query Selector All uh, make it a lot easier to query the DOM. So we don't really need it anymore. They also use ES6 modules, uh, which I just think is cool. It doesn't really get you anything for accessibility. Um, but this stuff is all in flux, and I'm super excited to see where it goes. T looking at a little bit of code from Angular 2, um, the, the Angular 1, you can see you bind to attributes, and Angular 2, it's actual properties where they're interpolating these and then binding them to the uh, element object. Angular 2 includes ARIA support, so we don't need ng-aria anymore. I think that ng-aria is sort of helping us where they didn't think about that the first time around. If you want to contribute to Angular 2, it's um, angular-angular on GitHub versus uh, github.com slash angular slash angular.js. 
it's a very uh, subtle difference. But there's already some really cool conversations about accessibility going on on GitHub. In my slides, I have some resources, like the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools browser extension. If you haven't used that, I use it all day, every day. I would highly recommend it. Uh, some other documentation and things that might help you out if you want to learn more. That's it. <laughs>